Correct. And now, prisoner realignment, Assembly Bill 109. That's the hashtag for Governor Jerry Brown's program to get the state to comply with a mandate from the courts, and that includes the U.S. Supreme Court, to reduce overcrowding in the state's prison. Uh, in the state's prisons. The states now are sending some less serious offenders to the counties to finish up their sentences and also giving the counties responsibility to handle their parole. About 16 months or so later, how's the program working? And what about complaints from some lawmen who claim the program's contributing to a spike in crimes? Well, joining me, Charles Kubrin, or Charis Kubrin, Charis as in Charlotte, Charis Kubrin, professor of criminology at UC Irvine and the former district attorney of L.A. County, Steve Cooley. And welcome to both of you. Charis, you are no Charles, you are Charis. I am and, definitely and, not. And, uh, so uh, but before we get going on this, just to kind of lay it out, how many prisoners are there in state prisons and what do we have to get it down to and where are we in that process? Yeah, that, that's a good question and it's important to get the context here. So California prisons, state prisons, are designed to hold a maximum of about 80,000 prisoners. And at, at our peak in 2006, we held about 173,000. So more than double. More than double. And the, when the Supreme Court came in and ruled in Brown v. Plata, the decision was that we needed to reduce prison population to 137% of capacity, or about 33,000 inmates by 2013 this year. Reduce it by 33,000. Yes. Okay. All right, and so that's where that's what we're doing now. That was okay. the charge, right? right? And that's what we're in the process of doing. So, Steve, uh, how's it working out? Well, I think uh, the evidence so far is pretty much anecdotal, uh, but I think it's working out uh, as some of us predicted early on that it is a criminal justice nightmare um, and going to be a public safety disaster. Uh, anecdotal evidence from throughout the state of California compiled by uh, the Criminal Justice Legal Foundation indicates that it is uh, 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 crime is increasing. And the infrastructure in terms of local county jails is woefully inadequate to handle the new uh, workload of incarcerated individuals. What happens is in these so-called non-serious, non-violent offenses, a judge announces a state prison sentence. You are going to state prison. Probation is denied. Eight years, ten years, twenty years, three years. But the jails do not have the capacity. That's true here in Orange County. It's true in Los Angeles County, it's true in San Bernardino County, it's true in probably the most counties throughout California. They cannot handle so, this So what's new happening? I mean, are literally workload. prisoners being moved and they're just being let go? I mean, what, what's happening? Well, uh, sort of a trickle-down effect. Uh, anyone sentenced to county jail, at least in Los Angeles, uh, for, for a misdemeanor uh, or uh, as a condition of felony probation, uh, are not doing any time at all, effectively. To make room for the individuals who are being sentenced to quote-unquote state prison, but have to serve their time right. in the county jail. And it's okay. just going to build on itself, build on itself, until at least in Los Angeles County and probably other counties, the sheriffs are going to be early releasing individuals, putting them on uh, you know, some sort of a house arrest uh, or maybe a GPS device. And we all know from Sunday's article in the LA Times, that's not working. Thousands of parolees, sex offenders, are dumping their GPS devices. So we're moving towards uh, what I predicted back when uh, AB 109 was first proposed. We're moving towards uh, disaster, okay. a public safety disaster. Charles, are we moving toward a disaster? Well, I think it's way too soon to make some of that sort of assessment. I, the key point that was raised by Mr. Cooley, I think, is the fact that we have anecdotal evidence at this point. And as a social scientist, I get very concerned when we draw grand conclusions from what is, in fact, anecdotal evidence. There has not been one official correct <coughs> policy evaluation of realignment, especially concerning its impact on crime rates. So to simply say realignment went into effect, crime rates went up or down, ab absolutely tells us okay. nothing about whether realignment is causing when, crime uh, to so go up So right now the evidence is anecdotal. What, may it take another year before we get some hard data? Or yes, what? and I think part of the issue is that looking at crime rates generally, um, whether they go up or down and then linking it back to the program is, is problematic, in part because those crime rates don't tell us who's actually committing the crime. Are these realigned offenders that are committing the crime or are crime rates going up for other reasons, perhaps perhaps related to the economy or housing and foreclosures uh -huh. or other kinds of factors that are occurring simultaneous with realignment? Okay, well what about the argument that Steve, uh, I, I think if I hear him correctly, that uh, what's happened now is because these, uh, I mean the county jails are kind of crowded too and so you're bringing in these state prisoners and so now you're releasing the people that were in the county jail, petty thieves or whatever they might be, and that they're out committing crimes. Right. Now, there are some individuals who will be released sooner than, than, than 
than normal, but I don't think that's across the board the case. First of all, we're at a historic moment here when counties themselves are getting the opportunity to define how to deal with these returning offenders. And what that means is that the counties can use the state funds to determine how best to serve their communities. If that involves uh, building more jail space, beds and jail, right. and jail space, great. If that involves uh, producing better rehabilitation programs for ex-offenders going back into the community, great. If that means beefing up their probation uh -huh. programs, great. But there's not really one uniform outcome here. There's okay. lots of different things going on. See, see, what about that, you know, these uh, the, the local law enforcement people? Stop your whining. You're getting money from the state and, you know, it, it takes some control of well, this and of, make it work. First of all, local law enforcement is not getting much money from the state. $20 million total was allocated to all frontline law enforcement in California. That's 79,000, 80,000 peace officers throughout California are going to divvy up $20 million. That's uh, chump change. So they're not getting it. It's going to sheriff's departments and probation to come up with and support and maybe outside vendor rehabilitation programs. I think that what uh, Jerry Brown and his uh, friends in the legislature did with uh, AB 109 or didn't do was they didn't talk to some real law enforcement professionals to see what is the likely outcome of this. Do you have the resources? They also didn't know or didn't evaluate the fact that the counties in, in uh, many instances were already doing a very good job in terms of identifying those that could be rehabilitated instead of going to state prison, should go to drug court instead of going to state prison, should explore other alternatives instead of going to state prison. We already had a pretty good system in the context of the determined sentence law and now they're sort of saying, oh, we're going to throw more money at you, now build a, a new and bigger system. We were doing a lot of things right. Sure. They just well, want to unload a population mm -hmm. of people the judges determined belong in state prison on to somebody else because they had a budget problem okay. and they had a Supreme Court well, uh, case problem. This sounds scary. I mean, should people be worried? Should, should we be worried that, uh, that, you know, we're not as safe as we were before this? Yes. Absolutely Charles. not. First of all, I'd like to go back to something that Mr. Cooley said, which is that we were doing a lot of things right. And I'd like to differ with that assessment. We had more people in prison than any other state in the United States. We've now been surpassed by Texas, but other than that, we were the leaders. We were number one, and that exceptionalism, I think, is something that California should not be proud of. Well, but not uh, only that, in addition to having the highest incarceration rate, we had the highest recidivism rate, close to 70%. So it was, in fact, for these reasons that something drastic needed to be done, not simply just adding to what we were already doing by giving a little bit more money to the programs that were existing. Rehabilitation programs in California state prisons had been slashed for the last 15 to 20 years. And the result of that is inmates that get out of prison with absolutely no skills and abilities to reintegrate back into their communities. Okay. What we're saying now is the states couldn't do it, Let's see if the counties can achieve that better. Okay, and so far, what are you seeing? I mean, are they achieving? It sounds like from what Steve's saying, they aren't achieving it. Uh, they aren't handling well, I it. I will go back to my original point that I stressed here is that we don't know. We simply do not know. Looking at what's going on with crime rates in some areas well, simply does not tell us whether a policy is working or not. Do you think that there are some prisoners, people that shouldn't be in prison that are? For example, I know there are some people who think our drug laws are too tough. There's too mm -hmm. many people who are just drug users and they shouldn't be in jail. I mean, is, uh, is that a way to address this problem? What I think we need to realize is that a one-size-fits-all approach did not work in California. That is incarcerate. We cannot incarcerate our way out of a crime problem. We absolutely have to find solutions that work. That means we need to draw on evidence that we have from criminologists and other social scientists about the role of reintegration back into communities, from public health yeah. scholars about prevention. Yeah. We need to find alternatives to incarceration. Well, uh, Steve comes at this as a lawman. You're, mm -hmm. you're a professor. Do you talk to police chiefs, to cops? I mean, what are they telling you? Absolutely. Probation officials? Absolutely. So when I first moved here to California two years ago, I just got re uh, introduced to this realignment concept, and I was shocked to hear about it and what was going on. This is literally the biggest uh, downsizing, prison downsizing experiment in, in the country. It, the implications are vast. I wanted to learn as much as I could. And so I began talking to all kinds of individuals about their thoughts about it, etc. It's time we move from these public discussions to scientific evidence about its impacts. My colleagues and I have several grants in in order to get funding to evaluate using proper okay. data 
whether realignment will cause crime rates to go up or right. possibly down. Okay. There's reasons to suggest realignment may right. actually cause crime rates to go down. I mean, that sounds probably to some as a, a, a scenario that could never happen. But in fact, if you sit and think about it, there's good reasons for that. Okay, Steve, uh, finally, you know, given that this is the situation California is now in, what, what would you recommend? Well, uh, if I had, if I were king, it would be repeal. You repeal bad laws. Uh, that's not realistic uh, in this environment. So it's, this one's going to be studied uh, and, and modified as best law enforcement professionals can. Uh, it's been amended three times. Uh, uh, it was a it was poorly drafted initially. Uh, there's been efforts to clean it up, uh, add certain crimes back in there. I do want to make one point. Yes, we did have the highest recidivism rate, uh, uh, a very high recidivism rate, which is. Uh, uh, when you take a look at that, that just means parole agents are identifying uh, people on parole who are committing new offenses or not abiding by the terms of their parole. So a high recidivism rate just means they're doing a good job. But the, the most important thing, before realignment started, we had the lowest crime rate in 60 years. I've been around long enough to remember uh, the late 70s, early 80s, and the late 80s, early 90s, when um, L.A. City that was the murder capital of the United States of America. Crime rate was through the roof. Uh, and so I have a little uh, institutional memory here. We achieved the lowest crime rate in 60 years. AB 109, so-called realignment, is going to unwind that. That's my prediction, and we'll see what happens. Okay, well, we'll uh, we, we will bookmark this show and revisit this when there's a little more data to see, uh, to see whether it's a disaster or something that's actually going to reduce the crime rate potentially. Okay. Uh, listen, something else I want to ask both of you because you both have perspectives on this. The recent Chris Dorner murder rampage, four people killed, two law enforcement officers, three more law enforcement officers injured. He's finally chased to the cabin in Big Bear and, and uh, burned to death, or uh, burned and he apparently committed suicide. Uh, you know, this... Um, this horrific thing, so many questions. One, one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, Steve, is uh, did the, you know, the LAPD, uh, their behavior in this, what kind of a grade would you give them? There was that one situation where they fired on a, on a car with two women mail carriers in the morning. Uh, they seem jumpy. Uh, is this to be expected or do you expect more professionalism from law enforcement? I don't know the exact uh the situation, the facts those officers confronted. Apparently the car was similar. The car was driving by with its lights out. There were direct threats against this particular target. Uh, the vehicle driven by the, uh, the uh, newspaper delivery ladies uh, was very similar to uh, <coughs> uh, the one that Dorner was believed to be occupied. I'm not going to second guess them. Um, uh, obviously, it should be investigated anytime there is an officer involved shooting in Los Angeles County. It is investigated not just by law enforcement, but by the DA's office independently yeah. uh, to determine uh, if the overall facts of the situation. Uh, but here you have a madman, literally, someone bent on revenge who had already uh, killed some people, executed them, uh, and had sworn to get others. This was a, a real challenge to law enforcement when they had to defend so many potential targets. So, uh, and I think that uh, the element out there that's sort of elevating Dorner to some sort of a cause uh, is not uh, thinking about the mayhem and the slaughter and the killing of uh, innocent people and law enforcement officers, mm -hmm. and they want to enter into some sort of intellectual debate about whether he was treated right in an administrative hearing. Well. Uh, first degree murder, uh, execution murders are not the way you handle your grievances when you don't win. What do you think about LAPD hearing. though saying now they, they're going to review some of these cases of, of dismissed uh, uh, cops? Uh, I, is I think post-mortems uh, are excellent. Anytime uh, you have a situation where you um, um, could look at something, study it, uh, reach out to others in, in other venues mm -hmm. and try to say, did we do everything we should do here? Is there room for improvement? That's fine. That's being a professional and that's being transparent and I commend uh, uh, Chief Beck uh, and the LAPD okay. if they do follow through yeah. on that. Charis, Charis your thoughts on, on this phenomenon and perhaps especially the social phenomenon of some people sympathizing with Dorner's uh, you know, racism charges. Mm -hmm. Well, it's nice to be able to talk about this now a few weeks out because I think right after something like this happens, we're still so raw from the emotion that something like this can happen and how it impacts people. So I think it's important once that raw emotion goes away to then try and take a more analytical approach to what had happened. For me as a social scientist, what 
I like to emphasize is the importance of kind of the bigger picture and the context within which this mass, this particular mass shooting, but other mass shootings have occurred as well. And I teach a homicide and suicide mm -hmm. class right you now at UC seconds. Irvine. <laughs> okay. And we, one of the things I like to recall, remind my students as we talk about this, as tragic as it is, that this really okay. represents a very small percentage of all killings okay. in the U.S. All right. Thank you. You, you get the last word, Charis. Mm -hmm. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbssocal.org and clicking on SoCal Insider. My illuminating guests have been Charis Kubrin and Steve Cooley. And a special thanks to Kevin James. And thank you for watching. I'll see you again on SoCal Insider. SoCal Insider with Rick Reef is brought to you by the following.